Good morning. Welcome to the Music Venue Trust and Creative Scotland webinar about the Scottish Grassroots Music Venue Stabilisation Fund. Um, we hope that if you're joining us, you are a venue considering applying to the fund or already in the process of working through the papers. This webinar is intended to help you, whether you're a member of the Music Venues Alliance or not. Um, I'll just explain, Music Venue Trust is a charity that works to protect, secure and improve the grassroots music venues of the UK. We have a membership organisation called the Music Venues Alliance, which is free to join for any grassroots music venue across the UK. If you haven't yet joined us, which means you're not getting the resources that we share or you aren't part of our network, please go to musicvenuetrust.com, scroll down to where you'll see Music Venues Alliance, and you can click on a button which tells you what that organisation is, and you can fill in the form to join. Right, this is not about Music Venues <laughs> Venue Trust, this is about the fund that is money coming from Scottish Government, it's administered by Creative Scotland, and I'm going to introduce you to Alan Morrison, who is the Head of Music at Creative Scotland. Morning, Alan. Good morning, Beth. So, yeah, and then so. I'm also going to bring in, sorry, I'm also going to bring in Lucy Stone, who is working with Music Venue Trust on our funding advice, and then I'm going to leave Alan and Lucy to talk about this fund, and um and allow you all to ask questions as the session goes on so let's bring in lucy morning hello. lucy hello hello morning okay and i'm gonna we're gonna hand over to alan to talk through creative scotland's role and then lucy will help with things about funding if you've got questions please put them in the chat and then they can be answered as time goes along but I'm now going to drop out and leave these guys to it because I'm not the funding expert and these people are. Okay, shall I go first, Lucy? And yeah, say go a little for bit it. about Creative Scotland. So, Creative Scotland is not the Scottish Government. It is an arm's length organisation whose role is to distribute um, the Scottish Government's culture budget and the national lottery money for the arts in Scotland. So this is public money and it comes with guidelines and strings attached, uh, which principally has always um, been an obstacle to us necessarily dealing with a lot of um, people in the commercial arts uh, and culture industry. Um, but these are unprecedented times and um, the government has been creating a series of different funds related to uh, COVID emergency or hardship uh, funding. Uh, and this has allowed us in this case to now create a fund of 2.2 million to help grassroots music venues in Scotland be sustainable for a period of time during this um, period where uh, live music is not able to happen. So for, from our perspective, this um, this fund contains elements that we have never dealt with before and hopefully allows us to, to reach out and start making some connections with people uh, who never normally would be able to come in for public funding. Um, is, there, is there anything, Lucy, you think would be relevant for me to say about Creative Scotland at the moment? In, this time. Sorry, I was just checking to see if there were any questions already. Mm. Um, I think, um, is it worth um, talking about this specific fund uh, for people? I mean, obviously, there'll be lots of people who've never applied for funding before, or they might have applied for funding, but not to you before. So I know uh, in the Music Venue Trust session we did the other day, it was kind of helpful to really understand what the funder is looking yeah. for when you're looking at these questions. Um, we could run through the questions one by one. Yeah. Um, shall I ask the question and then you yeah, say be, what you're looking for, be yeah? Good, and, and it's, it's, you know, uh, to give credit 
up front that this fund has come about because of um, Music Venues Trust having uh, discussions with the Scottish Government and, and, and flagging up uh, the needs of, of the venues uh, themselves. Um, from our perspective, it's it's good to have seen this and see it uh, evolve because we do feel very much that the venues, the, the grassroots music venues, uh, have a very important role to play in the ecology of live music and culture in Scotland. Um, and that's within the cities. It's it's far flung regionally as well. Yeah. We'll later on get into maybe some of the differences in, in how um, levels of capacity uh, differ in different parts of the country and so what would be defined as grassroots in one area may not be in another um, so it's I was asked about that uh, with the music venue trust session we did the other day you know what act what is a music you know grassroots music venue and in the end I was just like well if it quacks like a duck if you describe yourself as a, music, a grassroots music venue you probably are and actually the definition and the guidance from Creative Scotland is actually much broader than some other funders I've seen in their understanding of grassroots and very much what Alan said if you're grassroots live music for your community then you're a grassroots live music venue you know sometimes people think oh because I put on this kind of music I, I'm you know I'm not generally what people understand to be grassroots live music but if your community and your audience who come to see your work think that's grassroots live music you're probably a grassroots live music venue would you agree and and this is going to give us perhaps some some difficulties when it comes to uh, going through this whole process is that it's it's easier to set up um eligibility so we can work on eligibility in terms of capacity and um, business setups but when it comes to that definition of grassroots a problem for a fund like ours is how do we make that not just about individual interpretation oh. so so the fact that um, Music Venue Trust have good definitions of what is a grassroots music venue what is grassroots music activity has definitely helped uh, w with this because um, f what one person considers as grassroots music may be different than others and mm. we really you know that that sort of what you've got to avoid in uh, um, in a funding process when you're using public money is grey areas mm. because that's what you get challenged on and hopefully our guidelines for this fund and the, the discussions we can have today sort of makes that less grey and separates it into the mm. back of the ways. The, the terminology used in the guidance is all year round programme. Yep. And that, that all year round programme is live music. Um, there's, there's more detail within the um, guidance about who can and can't apply. There are a couple of types of organisations who specifically can't apply, which are Creative Scotland regular regular funded organisations so you would know if you were one of those yeah. or if you're operated by a local authority or a kind of related trust those kind of arm's length external organisations again you would know if you were one of those so those are not eligible for this fund but there yeah. are and Sorry. they've kind of been yeah they've kind of been um, helped through uh, another fund the, the performing arts venue relief fund mm. so when I think of um, some of the RFOs uh, that have, and, and some of the concert halls as well, local authority owned ones, um, that have already, that are already in that kind of mix and, and are in that fund. Uh, it, I mean, certainly in terms of um, grassroots music venues, if you think of the, the Lemon Tree in Aberdeen, it's part of the Aberdeen Performing Arts Organisation, which is one of our RFOs. So they got money already from that Performing uh. Arts Venue Trust. So I don't think there's anybody who would fit into a grassroots definition yeah. who would also be RFO and uh, Performing Arts uh. local there is, um... that, that haven't been uh, dealt with in other funds. Yeah. So there is a, a question that's popped up just about um, if venues actually put on their shows for free, is that a barrier to them applying if they don't charge for their grassroots live music programme? 
No, it's it's uh, it's about the content yeah. of the artistic program. So um, if it's clearly, and this is what we're looking at, it, it's in the in the first kind of question that people will have to look at, where it's about that you know the venue's impact on grass music. It's we're looking for people who are who are active and not passive. Mm. Shall I read the first yeah. question now? Let's start yeah. there. So the first question is, I'm just going to read it straight. Please provide a description of your venue, how long you have been in operation, what kinds of music you program and how often. Tell us something about your audience and specifically how you address the needs of those less well served. Also tell us about the impact your venue has on the local community and the development of musicians. You have 300 words. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's that, that's quite a lot of, to fit into that um, that word limit. Um, but it's, it's the essence of that is trying to get over your um, the beneficial purpose and impact uh -huh. and input that you have in your local area. Are you regularly putting on emerging bands and in some ways, particularly if you were offering some uh -huh. sort of um, nurturing to them? I'm not saying mentorship programs but in some ways of helping people get that first foot on the ladder oh. or helping people progress up the different stages of the ladder so again um i mean this is one of the things where it came to when we were talking about capacity we can imagine in glasgow and edinburgh there are a range of different venues that may take people over a couple of years from 120 capacity to 250 to 400 to 700 and that's your route of progression. Uh, we also understand that in some places, that route of progression may happen within one building that has a bigger capacity, but the, that venue starts people up the ladder and then provides ways to help them move up the ladder uh, as well. So that might be offering support slots to bigger touring bands. It could be uh, helping young promoters start putting on their first nights. Um, it's 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 where and again this is partly the public money element of it it's always about where are you doing something that brings good to the community uh, that's always something that comes through it's a lottery national lottery money guideline that if you come into our open fund you're supposed to be doing something that is of benefit to the Scottish uh, people and while that those kind of strings are not necessarily there in this fund because it's the Scottish government and the Scottish government want that impact on the scene, but also on audiences, mm. that element of if you can prove that you're contributing something to the local music community, then that is one of the real strengths you want mm. in this application. I and mean, what I've been saying to people about this question is this is really where you get a chance to show off. This is where you get a chance to say, this is why we're amazing. And if you don't know how to start this question, because it's quite a lot of different things in one question, just think about what you're proud of. What are you proud of in what you do? What are you proud of in how you support musicians? What are you proud of in terms of your local community and the audience who come to see your work? Kind of start there if you're really not sure how to answer, because there's so many things you probably do. You know, pick the main things that you would, you know, somebody had no idea who you were, what you do, what are the main things you would tell them and I'm a real uh, advocate for backing those things up with data um, you know it's all well and good saying we're a really popular venue but the it would be strengthened by saying we're a x capacity venue that welcomes however many thousand people through our door every month every year whatever that is because by giving those numbers you're showing them that you're a popular venue or you're always at 90 percent capacity or whatever it is that kind of backs up um your kind of statements you know making sure things aren't too anecdotal making mm -hmm. sure that they are backed up with kind of facts and figures and also um you know within that question is about your local community so what can you tell them about your local community and how you serve that community. And for those of you who are based in and outside of cities or in rural areas, you, your footprint might be quite large, actually. People might come quite far to your venue. You know, if you were to go, how far would people have to travel? I was working with a venue in Cornwall and they were saying, well, if we close, it's a, an hour on the bus and the bus only runs twice a day. Mm -hmm. So for young people, 
there's going to be no music venue for them. So if that's the case of why, you know, why you're important, what happens if you were to not be there? Um, you know, that's also answering that question about kind of where you fit in the kind of, um, some funders use this kind of cultural ecology word, where do you fit in the map around everybody else? Obviously, make sure you mainly focus on talking about yourself, um, but it is useful sometimes to give that context because whilst, you know, Alan knows all the venues, you know, very well and inside out, um, it might be that there are assessors or panel members who maybe haven't heard of you. So don't presume that they have prior knowledge of you, whilst people might do, you know, talk to this um, funder as if it's the first time, you know, they've ever heard of you. Um, I mean, anything it, else on that question? Yeah, I mean, it, it, even just, you know, taking on board what, what you say there about that explanation is that we will be keeping this quite tight within um, the music team and relative people at Creative Scotland uh, in terms of eligibility and, and, and the initial assessments. Um, so that there, there is a bank of knowledge there that we will know um, who's who, in most cases, of, of, of the applicants. Um, but it is definitely worth being clear with that description and not assuming that saying, hey, Creative Scotland, you know who my venue is, so, you know, why do I need to write more? Um, think that the... Uh, think that there might be people beyond this whole process who, because it's public money, can ask through Freedom of Information Act to see uh, who got funded and why. Now, so that, that means that what you're providing us as well is the evidence for us being able to say, yes, we, don't, we do know who this venue is and we do know the great role that they play in the community, but we've got the evidence from them from what they say that we were able to base that decision on, not just our, uh, not, you know, uh, self-knowledge of, of the scene. Um, I will say with, with Freedom of Information Act, if that ever comes up, there is no, we redact all um, personal data and uh, sensitive business information. So it's not like any c competitors would gain something from that uh, to see stuff. Hello, Lucy, you seem to have frozen. Yeah, I think Lucy's Hello. having some connectivity <laughs> problems. Yeah. Um, I think she's frozen again. Right. Thank you, Alan. Can I just ask a couple of these questions? Because the more that come in, obviously, we're going to lose some of the higher up ones. So I'm just going to take Lucy. Yeah, Lucy's gone again. I'll let her back in when she comes back. OK, um, we had a question. I can't see who it's from because this is obviously feeding from various sites. It says, obviously, the funding will arrive quite late. A decision won't come till the end of September and it's meant to cover till the end of October. What bearing does any time from November onwards have on this fund, given that uh, job retention scheme ends in October? Can I just say... <laughs> It's kind of not a question for Creative Scotland in a way because they didn't choose the parameters, but understanding that, I'm going to ask Alan to try and answer that question. <laughs> yeah, and, and in the time that it's taken to set up the, the fund, because there's all the other funds that we're having to work on at the moment, it is pushing it right late to that um, 31st October. Um, Sorry, everyone, my internet disappeared and then it reappeared and then it disappeared and... At least it wasn't a power cut. I had that on a live webinar recently. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we've turned off a load of devices and we won't be having that problem. So I've missed whatever Alan has said uh, in the last so, five minutes. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a question there. Bev put in a question uh, that was looking at the um, this fund covering, because its decisions are really coming quite late in September, and it was set up to cover the period until 31st yep. October, where you know, how does it really affect for, for after that? I mean, hopefully it would it would put people in that stronger position at yeah. to be in at the end of October when furlough or different things, you know, are, are, are changing and that's another lot of pressure that's going to come uh. between November and uh, end of March, the end of financial year. Now, we had been hoping, and I think it was clear from the initial talks that MVT were having with the Scottish government that maybe some some small activity might be able to get started yep. in November. And obviously guidelines are changing 
all the time, which is, has been a challenge for us all the way along since lockdown in that uh, quite often the, the information we can give people at the point of application, uh, the government guidelines about lockdown and social distancing have changed by the time it comes uh. to assessment and panel. Um, so we have to be reacting to that all the time. Um, I mean, the, yes, the, the, this is for costs, operational costs up until that point at the end of October. Um, the government would need to create another fund post then. Um, because that's a question some people have asked about what they can show in the um, kind of balance at the end of this funding period, like how, you know, because I think particularly music uh, venue trust members, they'll be aware of the Cultural Recovery Fund in England, where you're allowed to reflate reserves up to eight weeks. Um, uh, uh, you know, you're allowed to put that figure in, but that was obviously for October through to March period. Yeah. So they're aware that that's something that's happened in another fund and they're saying, is this something I could do in this fund? Like how how much can I put in the box to kind of keep me going and keep me strong going into November? I, I mean, the parameters of this seem to be to uh, to cover up to October. And yeah. That is, that is written into the guidelines. Um, I... You, I mean, one of the things that has been written about in in papers, uh, media up here in the last week is that all the rest of the money that you know, the Scottish government were given ninety seven million from Westminster for the arts, and there's people mm. saying, "Oh, there's still still seventy odd million left." You know, uh, there's been people in the, in the papers this week saying, "And it's all sitting with Creative Scotland. Why aren't you doing something with it?" And I have to say, no, it isn't. We've been trying to get stuff off the mm -hmm. government like anybody else. Some of the money is going to us, some's going to Scottish Enterprise. Some earlier this week went to, I think it was uh, Visit Scotland, you know, Event Scotland for events based um, activity, which has helped, uh, hopefully will help some production companies and tech companies in that side of the music business. Um, we are expecting within the next week, the Scottish government to start announcing some other funds. Um, right. We don't necessarily know what those will all be and whether there's different recovery funds more equivalent to what's been happening down south. It is very much um, a, within the Cabinet Secretary um, Fiona Hislop's uh, remit to decide what those funds will be. Uh, we know what we have been lobbying for. Uh, well, no, we don't lobby. Uh, Create Scotland's not allowed to lobby what we have been advocating for. Um, and I think that fi finally we're, we're going to start uh, seeing some other things coming out, which may give people another idea of what routes there would be. But this fund, in its guidelines, is, is fairly specific. In, in uh, the car. Yeah. And we lost Lucy again. We're losing Lucy again. <laughs> okay, right. So I'm going to come back in. Okay, so that was really helpful, Alan, what you said. I mean, it's helpful in that we know that these are the parameters of this fund and this is what people need to deal with. It does make the cash flow, the details really difficult. We're getting quite a lot of questions in and I'm actually going to jump. Alan S. Russell, we will come back to you. Um, I'm just going to go to the person i'm sorry i can't see your name you've come as a facebook user um there's no gardens regard regarding there's no guidance pardon me regarding how to gauge how much to apply for if we've lost fifty thousand since the start of lockdown even after other grants income is it okay to apply for that i think from the discussions we're having with members it's actually the financials that are causing the most difficulty in knowing where to pitch this because we understand that this is supposed to be for, you know, the defined period, and we understand the narrative questions. But what accounts to put in, what to what to emphasize, you know, what can be put at the end, that I think is what's causing venues the most difficulty in knowing how to look at it. And I am just gonna add Alan Ross's question into this as well, which is that. People are also concerned about how to account a bounce back loan, which some venues have taken, but I know quite a lot of venues have taken it as a cushion and not really intending to dip into it because they've got to pay it back. 
but obviously it's going to show as income and suggest they've got a lot more money to play with than in actual fact they feel they've got. So I think there's quite a lot of questions here about the, the accounting side of it that's making people very nervous about saying the wrong thing even though they know that you want to be able to fund them. Uh, yeah, and it's a difficult thing for us because this is the area that is so different from what you've got to supply in any other applications to Create Scotland because it's moving into the commercial sector and um, rules about state aid have to be applied uh, to this in a way that hasn't been that, that isn't there with with a lot of our other funds i mean with bounce back, bounce back loans in particular this was a question that um i ran past our director of finance who did say this funding cannot be used to repay bounce back loans if repayments are required in the period then they should not be included in the cash flow template so they can choose hold on so they can choose not to include income in the cash flow if well what you said was if repayments are required in the period they should not be included in the cash flow the repayment shouldn't be included yeah. but the bounce back loan. oh okay sorry so i think what people are nervous well, about is putting the loan in the income and then yeah. it almost i like, say they got a loan for twenty thousand. Um, it's in an income line, but they don't want to actually spend that loan until, you know, they yeah. really are in dire need in January, let's say. But the bottom line will show that £20,000 mm -hmm. as, you know, where they're standing in the bank. And they're worried that you'll knock that £20,000 off what they're asking for. I mean, that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to catch people... Yeah. out so within I'm, I'm just trying to look to see where within the questions that uh that might be able to be explained in words um i think there is i mean we only got through question one obviously yeah. there's five questions i don't know should we keep going through the questions and come back to that because yeah. i think we could highlight where i'll hold it back now Sorry, my yeah. internet is misbehaving today. I moved house not that long ago, um, and we're still trying to get used to it. So, I mean, should we just we, go through the questions? Just, yeah, and just what would you say on that one that the, the Bev brought up there is that yeah, um, if there are if there are particularly odd things or anything in the finance, um, don't just leave it to the figures and the cash flow. Find a place to explain that and saying we're. If, if if the loan and using the money for the loan later than the October deadline is what you're planning to do, tell us in words. Yeah. You know, we're we're yeah. we're trying to we want the we want the money to help people where it doesn't benefit us at all if this money is not spent. Yeah. Um so you know it's uh, do you think just lay it out really clearly? We'll yeah. come to the um, questions where you can talk about it in a minute. But, you know, you've made decisions based on the best uh, information that you had at that time. Mm -hmm. You got the loan. I mean, for some other funders, they're saying if you haven't exhausted all possibilities, if you haven't taken out all the loans, there's no point in applying to us. So some other funders, not Crave Scotland, are saying they want to see that you've done that. If you haven't taken a loan out, why not and why should we give you funding where it sounds like you're trying to be a bit more iterative in that process yeah. of understanding each business's decision making based yeah. on their you know kind of business modeling and etc yeah. so and capacities, staff capacities, yeah. yeah so question two is uh, please tell us how you are set up as a business e.g company partnership connected businesses etc and what the main sources of income are and char uh, entrance charges, food, beverages, etc. Again, 300 words. So I think here what they're trying to really understand is what's your funding mix? So if you don't have lots of ticket sales, how, what does your, um, you know, what do your costs look like? Where are you getting funding from? Because that will help them to understand why that income has been lost. Yeah. Now, uh, and I'm aware that there are some some venues that have uh, a strong grassroots activity uh, um, but they have a shop and a cafe 
uh, and uh, and other elements as well with it within that. So, um, you know, in in that case in specific, uh, I think there was a specific question you also asked me by email, uh, Lucy, which was, um, what you know, do do they have to break up the uh, showing the, the the venue from the rest of the business? And the advice we would give in that case is that they should only show the cash flow for the venue part of the business. Great, right. that's really so. Some venues um, are asking if we've got more, or we're a company, we've got multiple venues, or we're um, a business that has uh, a venue, but we also run a record shop and a cafe and whatever yeah. else. So the the um, uh, the guidance on that is just show the cash flow for the specific venue bit of the business yeah and, and okay. this is so this is so hot off the press that um i got those questions to our director of finance who has just emailed me with them so i'm reading them off my other computer here <laughs> at the moment um so he's also saying in that in that one um which was about uh, do they need to split the accounts to show accounts from for each venue as opposed to the company yeah. that manage them. What he's saying is no, the accounts do not need to be split. However, as stated above, the cash flow template needs to be for the venues only. Right, brilliant. Okay, that's really, really useful. There's probably, yeah, yeah there's some questions um, about that. Six venues under one umbrella, three yeah. of them, you know, oh yeah. So, so there's another one where it's, yeah, companies with more than one venue, can they put in one application per venue? So. Our advice on that is yes, provided that the applicant, i.e. the company or the sole trader, is the owner and tenant of the venue. If this is not the case, then a separate application is needed. Okay. And so you might have multiple venues and you're thinking, well, I, I need more than 50,000 for all of the venues. I need this much for each venue. So you might put an application in per venue. Yeah. Uh, yes. It, as long as the applicant is the yeah the owner or tenant um, which is part of the main criteria anyway yeah. you need to be the owner or tenant of the of the venue yeah and will you need to split the accounts to show accounts for each venue as opposed to the company that manages them there's no need to split the accounts however the cash flow template provided must only relate to the venue or venues right. being applied for so we can reiterate that when we come to the um, attachments that people need. So the next question, question three, is please describe the financial health of your venue prior to lockdown. So this is a 300 word uh, limit again. And again, prior to COVID is key there. You know, don't stray into wandering into talking about COVID. Those questions come next. You know, this is another facts and figures question, isn't it, Alan? You know, you really want to understand the makeup of the of the business beforehand it is uh, and it's, it's it's a guarantee to the government and the use of public funding that it's not going somewhere where it's a black hole uh hi but I, the, the little bit of advice that i would give here is that it's not just facts and figures i think if you can show um that you had gigs on yep. in december last year january february this year then you're showing that you were a going concern before yep. COVID. if yep. you had not had any gigs mm -hmm. on for six months prior to then that's maybe going to be a little flag to us thinking hang on that venue has been so quiet for so long leading up to when COVID happened how active are they what actual um benefit are they giving it uh, in that mm. definition so it's not it's not just a facts and figures yep. thing. i think you can illustrate the answer to this question by letting us know that um, regularity of yep. activity that you've got on. So your financial health backed up because of the activities that you were running as an yeah. org as a grassroots live music venue. That's really helpful. Um, question four, please describe the impact. So this is where we're moving into question four or five yeah. about, okay, and what next? Um, please describe the impact that lockdown has had on your venue and what support you've received or expect to receive from other funds to help address these challenges. Again, it's 300 words. Yeah. My tip in this would be connected to what we were saying in question one as well, is that not just to say it's had this effect that I've been shut down and there's been no income able to come in add to that but also it means that the local community has not been able to have this provision of music in this period and and so widen it out into again illustrating your role 
within uh, the sector and within the community, because that is some that's an impact if you've been shot. As well. Yeah. So you want to know about the um, the non financial impact of lockdown on the community that you serve, as well as See, the I, financial impact. Yeah, I do. I mean, this is this is the kind of I guess the difference in what Creative Scotland might look at from this than if this fund had been run through. Um, Scottish Enterprise, which would be really looking at it from a business point of view, uh, is that we're still filtering all of this through our thoughts of what we were talking about earlier, you know, ecology of yeah. the live music sector. So it's getting over to us um, what what isn't... If you're not active during lockdown, what is missing? Because that yeah. tells us if you closed, what would be missing permanently? Yeah. But so just bear in mind, it's 300 words. So you've yeah. got to be really so careful bit, and tight about the balance, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little hint of that. And, yeah. But also fulfilling what it's actually asking for in terms of, of the financial side of it as well. And then question five is the final narrative mm -hmm. question in the form, which is please state the amount of funding you're requesting through this application, which is substantiated by the submitted cash flow analysis and impact you expect it to have on your venue. Again, 300 words. Yeah. Now, the 2.2 million figure was came about through, before we were involved um, with administering the fund, it, it came about through discussions that MVT were having with uh. the Scottish Government. And it was looking at, from the membership of MVT, um, what what was likely to be the operational costs over that uh, over uh, the three month period leading up to the end of October, um, and knowing that some mem there's a there's a balance of obviously more than the membership will be able to apply, but some members, as I was saying, are actually being um, dealt with in different funds as well. So hopefully uh, we're still hoping that it comes in about two point two million. Um, I mean, the, the main things to say about this is that you're, that you're asking for what you need, you're not inflating your cost because this fund will become more, it, if, if this fund goes way over the 2.2 million and then it starts, it starts to become more competitive um. and we'll have and a later panel stage after assessment. Will then be having to look at offering people reduced amounts from what yeah. they asked for. Yeah. That said, the one thing that we in all of our funds tell people is do not think, oh well, if I if I need if I need 30k, if I ask for 40, I'll maybe get the 30. Uh, we don't we don't ever apply that. Uh, that that, I think that's an outdated way of thinking of... My experience of grassroots music venues is the opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, we reviewed nearly 200 so far for various different funds. And my actually quite often my feedback to venues were, you're asking for 20, but when I look at your cash flow, I think you need 25. Mm -hmm. And there was like, well, we'll make do, you know, others are in more need than we are. You know, there's this kind of like, well, as a community, you know, so actually I'm finding a lot of venues are kind of understating uh, what they need as opposed to, yeah, of course there are some that you look at and you think, mm, okay, actually you probably could be doing with a bit less. Um, so it really, I think also in this question, you have the opportunity to say, some of the assumptions that you've made in your cash flow. So to help them understand why you're applying for less than you think you might need or more than you think, you know, what are the assumptions there? This might be where you talk about the bounce back loan. This might be yeah. where you talk about, you know, what you, you already know that when you open in November, you've got a larger capacity than many because of X, Y, Z or a smaller capacity because of X, Y, Z. You know, here is where you can kind of, um, explain, like show your working in your cash flow, explain your cash flow and why you're thinking yeah. about those things. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like the thought that there's there's that sense of community. If I know it's it's difficult when survival is um, yeah. is so key at the moment, but it yeah. you know, it was great when the closest I have worked on um, to this type of fund was when near the start of lockdown we operated a, a bridging bursaries fund for individual artists 
and um, that was up to two and a half thousand to, uh, uh, and and that was a very quick fire uh, assessment. And it, but it was meaning people were coming to us who didn't normally, as is, as is yeah. the case with this one. And I do remember one particular thing when when people could apply up to two thousand, but one said, "I'm only applying for five hundred because my brother owes me a couple of grand." <laughs> you're thinking that it's just showing showing that responsibility of, for the yeah. rest of the sector and thinking I'm not going to take too much is it, it's it's good it's good to see that and so what we're really trying to stress is do ask ask as Lucy is saying there ask for what you need mm. don't undersell it but equally don't anything, if, if yeah. you ask for more and you get it it literally <clears throat> means in a close 2.2 million like this you're taking it from someone else yeah if you really don't need it so it's really yeah careful thinking so you also need to upload some mandatory um documents which we'll, i'll just talk about mm -hmm. uh briefly now because some of the questions i'm seeing are relating to some of these as well and then we'll just kind of do some general questions yeah. so um they want to see you upload your latest set of annual accounts if you're a company please provide the accounts that have been submitted to uh, company's house plus any more up-to-date unsubmitted annual accounts so that might be your management accounts um, this is where some people were saying well if we've got multiple uh, venues do we need to split it and the guy what, what Alan is saying is no just upload your annual accounts for the for the whole company and your management accounts for the whole company it's in the cash flow which is the next number two attachment is the cash flow that's where you just talk about the venue and the cash flow has a template and you have to use their template. Uh, it's a very simple template. It's just income, expenditure. There's a couple of boxes you need to make sure you fill in a green box and uh, a blue box. Um, but it's very, very clear. Uh, it shouldn't be that complicated. My feeling is you shouldn't be needing to go off to your accountant and asking them, you know, spending loads of money getting your accountant to fill it in. It should be... Um, a relatively, you know, and also I'm saying this having seen some of the other finance documents that other funders have asked for, it isn't intended to be, um, you know, too difficult. But it is also another place where you can explain what's going on. You know, if you, you don't, you can add lines, you can put whatever headings you want. There is an example, but it's another place where you could explain what's going on. You know, if you want to separate out staffing costs, so you can see who's coming in and who's going out and when people are coming back off furlough and all those kind of things. For me, for me, the financial documents are often underused in helping to tell your story. You know, I feel like this is another place where you can help explain to them what what's going on in your company, in your venue. Yeah, I think so. And so it's um, it's it's different types of information than we normally have to ask for um but we have the backup of our our own finance team who will be looking yeah. at this so it's not just going to be left to the myself or the music officers yeah who maybe have more expertise in well uh less expertise in in really looking at financial accounts uh, i always say that before i've been in this job for four years before then i was a journalist for 27 years so i'm good with words less good with figures but where we have those teams there and we have the ability as we've said um in the guidelines that if we if we did need um to pull in say scottish enterprise to look at something uh, as well we're not planning to really have heavy external sector bodies use coming coming into this but if there's, you know, it, it means that it, thing, things will be looked at properly by uh, people who have expertise in those kind of financial areas. Yeah. Uh, but we have we have it internally in our, yeah. our finance department. I'm um, just sorry, I noticed a question on the annual account. So if your annual account financial year runs April to March, mm. you would have your certified by an accountant annual accounts for 18, 19, so up to 31st of March. 2019 and then you probably have a set of management accounts from April 2019 to March 2020 yeah. and the cash flow starts in April 2020 so actually you would be showing Creative Scotland 
that whole um, you, there wouldn't be any gaps in what you, you were showing them. If your annual um, accounts run to December, so you've submitted annual accounts to December 2019 to Companies House or whoever, and your um, uh, management accounts go up to December uh, 29, 20, sorry, you submitted 2018, they got 2019. They're saying you don't need to worry about that gap. Like you don't need to then produce another set of management accounts for January, February, March, that that would show them enough information. So you're just kind of showing them some background information on that you were at, because you need to have been, um, you know, financially viable before COVID in order to apply for this fund. So that's the way that you kind of show them, um, show them that. Um, there's two more mandatory things you need to upload. Uh, one is the most your most recent bank statement or pay slip. Um, basically, I'll just read the whole thing. The attachment, which can be a PDF scan, screenshot or photograph, must clearly display the bank account name, sort code or account code and account code, sorry, that must be matching the bank details you provide in your application. So you're basically they're making sure that what you put in your form for your bank account is where the money will go. And that's the same business that is apply or same individual who's applying for this fund. So that's that's part of their due diligence checking. There's nothing more than that in there. It's just them, you know, it's just their double check. And then the final thing you need to upload is a copy of your PRS live music license. If you hold one, if you do not hold one, you don't need to upload it. You're not going to be you know, mark down because you don't have one. They just want to see it if you have one. If you haven't renewed it because you haven't been open and it wasn't a priority for your budget spending, don't worry about it. Just upload your last one. That, you know, for some reason, people are very worried about this one. But if you don't have one, don't don't worry. Can I just stress with this, this is not anything to do with eligibility. It's, it's just, it's almost like a little bit of data gathering for us. It's like, it'll be useful for us to know sort of out there at what level venues have PRS yeah. licenses, but this is nothing to do with eligibility. There is no mark against you if you don't have one. Yes. So it won't count against you, yeah. just to answer that question really clearly. So there's a range of questions which kind of, you know, I'll, I'll just read them as, as, they're, mm -hmm. as they're written. Um, so there's venues that are late uh, night do electronic music, music DJs and live electronic sets rather than bands. Are they as likely to qualify if they can demonstrate they are part of the talent development and are key to bringing their local scene to audiences? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't certainly in Glasgow, you cannot underestimate in the last few decades how important Glasgow has been to the uh, to the electronic music scene. So uh, yes, it is the thing that it's it's to get that distinction between. Uh, clubs who may who are putting on Britpop nights and clubs who have DJs who are yep. creating new music. It's all about it's all about the creativity. It's all yep. about the originality. And if that is what is th that if that is the music that's being played in the club and it's and it's creating a scene uh, of of creativity, then you are as valid as people who are picking up guitars and singing. Yeah, and it is actually in the guidelines. I'm just scrolling up to see if I can find the event. Yeah, actually, in the guidelines, it says the venues can apply if they host M DJ and MC based events, but also have live music um, yeah. program focusing on grassroots talent and original material. Yeah. Um, a lot of funders aren't that explicit. They're being really explicit that yes, that does include those kinds of venues. Um, with, but with that emphasis on there has to be a, a good sizable part of it is is about original music creation doesn't matter about genre doesn't matter yeah. about instrumentation it's about yeah. um, originality of making making new making new songs making new tunes um, and it's why uh, bars that have live music perhaps every night but that live music is uh, cover bands or musicians doing maybe even if they were dropping one or two original songs into it predominantly their sets uh, are, are, are are covers that's not really the definition of a grassroots music venue and you, I think you would be able to say in that case yeah. that the um, the selling of alcohol or food was the predominant business yeah. with the music as an element on top of it rather than music venues that also have bars and other 
uh, other trading yeah. aspects. So Which also covers those people. venues who put the music on for free, right? Because actually what they're doing is programming music. They might be using the bar to, to prop up the fact that the, the yeah. gigs are free, but they still want to pay musicians. You know, the focus of that business is putting on live music. Their business model means that they, you know, they need the bar sales to do that for free. But that's the driving, you know, that's the yeah. their reason for being. But if the free if the free music is local musicians and local bands making their own music and performing yeah. their own music, then that's what we're looking for. Yeah. It's yeah. just that it is something we came up against with the bridging bursaries in the <clears throat> it wasn't saying that we think less of people who play in bands and do cover versions but our role as creative scotland is to support people who are making new uh. music new artists so so people were in were being ineligible if they were in um if predominantly what they did was was be in a wedding band or perform on cruise ships or even just yep. you know do oasis covers in a, in a bar that isn't for th that isn't the purpose of creative scotland yeah but people who had recorded their own e e an ep or an album uh, or something like that and were out there doing things that is that is yeah what we can so this is what we're looking for here is we're looking for those venues in any genre who are providing that space and that nurturing for for new fresh creative activity uh, but not bars and clubs that yeah. are playing existing i'm not doing that um i don't i think you might have covered this question um but it got asked again so maybe not which was um uh there's no guidance on how to gauge how much to apply for if we've lost fifty thousand since start of lockdown mm. uh even after other grants and income is it okay to apply for that my understanding is it's not about what you've lost, it's about what you need to get through yeah. to, to the end of October. It wasn't to be seen as, and this is again going back to the, the roots of the creation of this fund uh, with the government and the Music Venture Trust, mm. uh, is that it was about operational needs, it wasn't about income yeah. replacement. Yeah, yeah. So it's about laying out your cash flow. This is what's come in. This is what we need to spend out. These are the actuals for the first bit of the year. And this is where we're getting to in October. That's the gap. And so that's what we're asking for. Um, I feel like that that fits what, you know, what yeah. you're looking for. It's not about money, replacing money lost. It's about yeah. what you need to stay open. Um we have six venues under one umbrella uh, company. Three of them are live venues, one Scotland, two in England. How would we show the split between the bounce back loans? Oof, interesting one. Um, I, I, I don't know where to start. I, I don't know. Um, I guess, have you? Well, one of the things you would obviously need to be careful of if you've gone to Arts Council England for your two English venues. Mm. Um, you would need to be very careful about what you've represented in your Arts Council England applications and what you're representing in this application because no funder ever wants to ris risk double funding something. Yeah. So I think that's partly about unpicking what you've already told other funders and how you've presented that um, to Arts Council England. If you haven't been to Arts Council England and this is your first one, I don't know. What would you say, Alan? I don't. I mean, I've you know, it's obviously, it's you know, stating the obvious to say it's only the Scottish one that sell it, uh, that's eligible for us, yeah. so unpicking that with the cash flow. But as regards the the loan, if the loan, I don't know, is it, is it an equitable split in three uh, and thirds that this, uh, this applicant is thinking that that loan was, if it's three venues, it's equitable? Is the Scottish venue much smaller than the English ones? Yeah. You probably, you probably need to try and get that information over to us but as we were saying before it's the um that the loan um repay repayments aren't yeah. part of that the cash flow anyway it's just showing it as the income i guess yeah. again this is where you need to look at question um kind of is it four or five where you're kind of saying what you've done in this time. So in question four, you know, you're kind of saying the impact the lockdown has had. So you've got a loan for blah for the company, but this is the bit that you had allocated to this this part of the company. 
Um, okay, we have a seasonal uh, music venue. The programme is mostly Scottish traditional music. We operate all year round, but even in normal trade years, we're at a loss through winter. Uh, which we do to serve our community. Any cash reserves from bounce back loan, etc., at the end of October will be wiped out to get through the winter. But don't want the cash flow to be misread and uh, you think that we're fine, um, that we have funds in the account. Like, How do we explain this in the application process? I, I mean, I think... To say, ex explain exactly that yeah. the, the the seasonal nature due to the geography, due to I guess yeah. this is this is connected to tourism, you know, yeah. in in the area you may be in. Um, I mean, I think it's important to stress with this is that we're not going to be going through those and go, aha, here's the here's the anomaly. This is why we can make this you know ineligible, not fund it. What we're trying to do is accept that. These are unprecedented times, and as I've discovered in the last six months, so many applications are coming in, and the the scenario is unique to so many different applications. So, just explaining that uniqueness to us helps us go. That's why this is the situation, yeah, yeah. Um, and why we might need to deal slightly differently with still within the broad guidelines, but slightly differently in thought with this person because the circumstances they are in where it might be caused by the location that they're in is is something that um has to be taken into consideration yeah so and again they don't yeah. necessarily know that about your venue so it's really important that you include that information mm -hmm. in your application um you know as we said kind of right at the top don't you know i never know the difference between assume and presume don't think they have any prior knowledge just really clearly lay that out and why you need these figures to look like that in order to continue to kind of serve your um, community. Um, it, the figure in I-57 of cash flow is really crucial as it affects uh, what your blue box figure, which is the figure you're asking for, would look like. Um, in the worked example, at the end of the cash flow, the venue is left with 5,000, which is where they started. Is this just an example? Uh, 5,000 isn't enough for many venues uh, to have in the bank at the end of the period. Is there a kind of rule of thumb? I mean, we kind of talked about this at the top, didn't we? Yeah, you know, is that it, was just is it five percent? Um, yeah, no, I think I think our director of finance actually did. Yeah, there was a question actually that uh, this is like the question that you sent me by email yeah. just the other day, isn't it? About the yeah, as an example, do you expect the do we expect the cash balance at the end of the month in box? I-57 to be the same figure as the beginning B-53, yeah? Yeah, so yeah. What, well, it's what, that, it is partly that question yeah. and partly, go on, answer that bit of it. And okay, then well, what Ian said yeah, about yeah. that was that uh, in the example, the amount requested from this fund was adjusted so that B-53 equaled I-57. Yeah. The starting balance, B-53, was low, 5,000. Therefore, requesting funding to get back to this modest amount is reasonable. If the starting cash balance was significantly higher, then we would not expect the same approach as uh, the aim of the fund is to prevent closure and stabilise. Precise numbers cannot be provided for this as it depends on the venue's scale yeah. costs. So I think some venues are thinking, well, we did really well to you know, build up our reserves and blah, blah, be in a really strong position at the start of March. Um, you know, they're concerned that almost... Um, they're not going to be able to build up those reserves by the end of October in the same way, whereas other venues who didn't have so much built up for whatever reason, you know, that they're going to be able to get more. But the reality is this is the fund where it is. The intention of the fund is to keep you open. Um, and if that means you need to use your reserves, that's kind of, I think, where we're at with it. So there's, yeah. there's no kind of feeling that they could apply for could ensure that that's kind of two months of running costs or a certain percent of turnover or there's there's no real feeling on that yeah no there's a bit where again in a question that you'd asked was about guidance on what we meant by modest yeah and referring to the to the um the balance at the end of the funding period so with that we think that three months overheads is a reasonable number but if this results in the end cash number being significantly higher yeah. than the venue size then the opening cash balance than the opening cash balance then we would consider reducing the award 
as it would give the impression that the funding would be improving the overall yeah. cash position of the venue. Yeah. Okay, that's really useful. Oh, so that that that, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I, I think we can share that out uh, with yeah. venues in more detail. Because um, I think um, the other question with that, with I think it's just because in the example it shows it as that, mm. that made people go, oh, but my opening balance is X, Y, Z. One of the other questions um, sometimes I get asked about is, um, if we were building up reserves to do a specific thing, like we were building up our reserves in order to put in a disabled toilet or we needed the roof fixed or whatever, and essentially those that money in the bank should be ring fenced for that purpose, mm -hmm. how, how might we show that uh, in the cash flow or um, uh, is that what we would explain in the questions? The reason yeah. we have, you know, £50,000 is because we were about to do building works and we need if to it, keep that ring fenced or whatever. Yeah, if it is something that's to be ring fenced and therefore it's not, <clears throat> it's not the reserves that are there for the general yeah. operating costs or winding up or whatever. It's It was for a specific purpose that we wouldn't know about unless you actually put in words yeah. what it is, then, then yeah, just tell us that as well. Great. Um, or back on the PRS. Um, well, can I just, just come in because I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the questions and I, and I still think this is still the thing stressing people out the most and they really are worried about you know coming back to zeros and stabilization I can see as a comment are worried about the words modest and reasonable um, about three months things like this and also the bounce back look I'm paraphrasing Alan but I think what I'm looking for is confirmation that they need to explain why their cash flow says what their cash flow says and they need to use the opportunity of the narrative to do that and so if you have ring fence funding if you've taken a bounce back loan but you're trying really hard not to use it because you're worried about how you would pay it back in the future therefore you don't want it to count against you you need to explain that in the narrative and stop worrying that the cash flow sheet and the narrative will be assessed entirely separately is that a fair comment that's that's said more succinctly than i could yes okay so so it's really about yes it applying for funding is stressful and there is not a guarantee that you'll get everything you apply for but the best thing you can do to represent the best case for your venue is to create the best cash flow possible and then explain why that cash flow is in your application yeah, yeah? if there's okay. anything if there's anything that's unique to the way you're doing it or a little bit odd compared to what the majority would be doing just explain to us what it is don't leave it as looking odd just uh. explain to us I'm going again. I just, I just hope that might head off some of these other questions because I'm going through them in order, which doesn't necessarily make sense. No, well, that's what I can see. That's what you're doing, with you, so that's why I wanted to jump in. Because yeah, I think absolutely. it's the main thing that's really worrying people because obviously they're so stressed about their finances. But again, to reiterate, Creative Scotland are going to try and help you. They're not going to try and catch you out. So you must explain why you've decided to go for the amount you have, why your cash flow says what it does. And you've just got to really try and be as clear as possible about the case you're presenting. And there's not a, oh, they've got a bounce back loan, they haven't spent it all, they're not entitled to anything stamps. Yeah. So just talk about the fact you went for a bounce back loan and what it means to you and how you're trying to present it. Okay, so now I'm going to let Lucy go back to the order she was doing things in. Thank you, Bev. Uh, so back to PRS licenses. Uh, if you can't find the license but you have the invoice, is that okay to upload instead? Yeah. 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 Um, somebody here taking over an existing business. Um, I'm guessing that's an existing venue in January this year. So they don't have par prior accounts. Uh, they were open for six, seven weeks before lockdown um, and were obviously developing the grassroots music venue. How would this affect uh, what they're applying for when they don't have accounts at 18, 19? So pre-existing, but yeah. they only took over it. I mean, what we would probably, you know, in terms of that owner new ownership, where we've thought on that is that a change in ownership doesn't matter provided 
that it was a grassroots music venue since July 2019 and is in need of funds, you know, so it, the, the ownership is, if the venue's got that existing thing, but you're saying that they wouldn't ha have the, the accounts from that period. Yeah, so they don't have accounts to upload because they weren't, I mean, I guess if they were a company doing other mm. stuff, they could upload those accounts, but if they, they wouldn't have accounts relating to mm. that grassroots music venue. Yeah, so what, so what might be able to be illustrated there is that the new owner is a verifiable business and that's a these are accounts for that owner but not anything to do with this venue but we would also be able to prove that this building had been a venue previous to that ownership uh we may have to yeah again it's the first time this has come up as a, as a as a thing we have to look at so that might be the explanation that we'd need and the way we'd have to look at it if uh. um if we don't have management accounts for the previous yeah. owner because there's another related question that we only started trading on in october 2019 however we had a strong program of events up to closure good diary for 2021 uh worked really hard in the first six months um but they wouldn't have full accounts that's another one but you know the the date that you've stated that they yeah. that has been stated is july 2019 if the mm. venue wasn't exist in existence in July 2019, you saying that they can't apply if they a new venue in 29 October. Yeah, I think that would that would fall foul of eligibility because of the the earlier date. Right. Um, so could they look at one of the other funding pots to apply for for other things they've got planned or other activity? Yeah, I mean at the end of this we can talk a little bit about um about open fund and what's okay. you know our weekly rolling open fund and what is and isn't uh, eligible okay that, that. i think that'd be useful for a lot of let me i'm gonna what i will do as well is I'll, I'll try and get some clarification on some any venues that are open later than uh, yeah. july uh, and we will get that and Back, back to back. yourself and Beth, Brilliant. and you can you Thank can try you. and distribute that information. Um, made so another point. interesting one: uh, we suffered flood damage earlier this month. We don't have a quote, but it's looking like ten thousand pounds of damage. Insurance won't cover as the policy has ten thousand excess on flooding. They've applied for compensation from the council. It's the council's fault because they didn't clear the street gullies due to cost cutting at this time. Um, they don't know if the claim will be successful or not. Should we include this in our application and cash flow statement? Because they're gonna have to spend that money in the next few months um, because, and they won't be able to reopen until they've done that repair work. Mm -hmm. So should that be included in what they're asking for? Um, uh, is that, is, does that count in operational? Um, is that another one worth coming back on? Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's really specific. It is, it, yeah. It's specific to that venue, but actually there were some other venues who said that they'd had, not a, not necessarily flood, but had had other things like that happen where there was some kind of damage whilst closed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that ordinarily they might have had the funding for or whatever, but right now they don't. Um, uh, if you can't replace money lost, how will you reopen? I think that's that question again. It's not about money lost. It's about here's your income because you you, you don't um, need the same expenditure for this period as you would have previously have had. So you need to show in your cash flow income, show in your cash flow what is the expenditure. You know, your staff are on furlough. You've had income from the furlough scheme. Maybe you ran a crowd funder. You've used some of that money. Your... Um, your current costs in the March to um, October period are not your normal running costs. So again, it's not about replacing money lost. It's about the gap between what you've had in, what's going out, and therefore what you'll need by the end of October. I think that's right. But I think, I think that's just a, a head shift thing for a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah, and... You know, across, if you think the, the emergency funding that was put aside in Scotland for this is 97 million. And if you looked across the entire culture and heritage sector, 
at trying to reimburse people for lost income. Yeah. Ninety seven millions a drop yep. in the ocean. So that that's why we're having to look at things like sustainability in this way, mm. rather than there's just there's just no no way that the the, the amount of money exists. I think it's about putting the cash flow together and seeing what that looks like for you. You know, each venue is going to look quite different. Um, uh, it's about making sure that you can get through to the end of October because, you know, as Alan said, there are hopes that there will be another fund or something else available for the period after that. It's about making sure that you have enough money to make sure you don't close before the end of October. That's the stabilisation it's talking about. It's not a fund that's talking about stabilisation after October, um, which does seem we you know kind of counterintuitive to, to some people. But it's because we don't know what's coming next. This fund has specific parameters. These are those parameters, and those are the ones that you've got to work to when you're making your applications. Um, sorry, I'm now skimming through. If the venue has a three floor venue providing a platform on its ground floor for emerging Scottish traditional musicians, original music on its first floor and local DJs and electronic acts on its top floor. Is it best for an application to focus on the floor that puts on original musicians? Yeah, because that's, that's, that's your core grassroots yep. activity. Um, and th there is a defined space for that. It's not even yep. shared you know, shared stages of that. So, so yes, I think so. I mean, give us the context of exactly what that says about how the venue mm. works at different levels. I wonder if I think I know which one that is from that description. <laughs> but uh, but uh, <laughs> they don't all have a name. Uh, hmm. But uh, but do yeah for for the purposes of this fund, make very clear that although there are other things going on, this is a clear picture of your emerging bands yep. and grassroots activity. Okay, I'm just skimming through the ones that I think Bev was covering, going back to that question. Um, what if the cash flow on your business is a director's loan and not predominantly profit? So if your income shows a director's loan, I'm not 100% sure that or what that question means, sorry. Do you know? I'm not. So let me just read it word for word. What if the cash flow in your business is a director's loan and not predominantly profit? I don't understand the question. Sorry. Could you could you ask that question with a little bit more? Unless you understand that question, Alan. No. No. OK. Sorry. Uh, that's John. Oh, we've got a name on that one. Could you just fill that question out a little bit? We don't quite um, understand it. Uh, oh, some people are saying, where do you get your accounts? You can go to company's house to download them. Um, ah, the person who was asking about only programming since January, the venue has been in existence for nine years. So where the venue is pre-existing your ownership and running it, that's totally fine. It's the, the question where it's, uh, we're trying to work out um, new venues, venues that open for the first time after July 2019. That's where there might be... Um, an issue. Um, I can't see any more questions. If there are any more, please do pop those in. I don't know if we're getting I'm, a follow up from John about. I'm going to come back in about the director's loan. I think what that means is that it is the person that, that owns the venue, that runs the venue, that basically has put their own money in. Yeah. But obviously it needs to take some of it back out this question is going to arise quite a lot we've had this with all funding applications everywhere in the uk which is as we know a lot of the people that run grassroots music venues don't really pay themselves so they've been here we go the direct loans where the owner has been propping up the venue with their own money surely it shouldn't be a penalty to the venue where they would get less less from this fund yes exactly we we know that most venues an awful lot of venues exist because the key person in the venue doesn't take money out for themselves, but takes money out only when there's a visible profit or even has invested their own money in it, but may need some of that to come back out on a regular basis, that being the director's loan, in order that they can um, 
feed themselves. We've had horror stories of, you know, particularly where people live in venues of them literally having no income because the venue's closed. So it's about that conflation of personal money with yeah. the business. And if that's another thing you just you need to really clearly explain that. You know, don't just write loan in the box, write director's personal loan to business, blah, blah, whatever it is, you know, be really clear in the box and re be really clear in the narrative. You know, I know we spend an awful lot of time saying to venues, you do need to pay yourselves. Um, yeah. You know, and I know yeah. with other yeah. words, funds. It's, yeah. money, isn't it? it's that, oh, my, bro my brother lent me this. So that looks like I've now got loads of money. And it goes back to what we keep saying about a narrative that fits with the cash flow you're showing because we all know that um, venues can be run in some weird and wonderful ways and there are a lovely bunch of mavericks across the UK running venues and you may be doing something that nobody else has thought might be the way that your venue survives but if you're worried that that then looks on a sheet like you've got loads of money that you know you don't have in reality please explain it mm. you know the figures on their own are not a story without the narrative that goes yep, with it. Yep. But coming back to this thing that we say a lot through this session is you have to absolutely present both sides of this in a way that's going to allow Alan and his team to understand the way that your venue is run. Yep. Because there is absolutely no one size fits all across Scotland. We have an incredible array of different types of venues. And do be careful where, where your personal finances and your company finances get muddy um just be really clear about some of that stuff you know i have i read some applications for english venues where you know that is the case you know they live in the venue xyz um you know and they really clearly laid out the difference between those things and there were others where they thought what they needed to do was present everything about their finances because they are the venue so you know i had to say to somebody you you shouldn't have dog food as a line in your expenditure you know so i think that's quite an extreme case but i think where you are, your venue, you live in your venue, your venues be, you know, for some of them, they're, the venue's been in their family for three generations. And, you know, they are completely entwined in that space. Just kind of have a think about what that looks like for somebody coming to it for the first time. Yes, pay yourselves, but don't put things like dog food in. So there, there is, you know, there's probably a line there somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm just asked a question about that, about, you know, the cafe bar venue are interlinked depending on each other to exist. We, we know what venue you're talking about, Joe. Just explain it really yeah. clearly. So just back to this um, money's lost. Uh, yes, um, you're right. Um, it's a deficit created by being closed. So it's, you're right. It's not, not about money's lost. It's about the hole that you have because the venue has been closed. Uh, has been closed. Um, the director's loan. Da, da, da. Uh, my venue was a pub before. They did do occasional gigs, but we're not a grassroots music venue. We totally changed the venue into a more focused on music venue for the region. Would this affect my July 20, 2019 date because the venue started operating in October? That's the one that Alan's going to come back to us on, right? So it was a venue, but not grassroots music. That's probably an important thing. Um, where there are complicated situations that require more than 300 words, can we upload a supplementary document? I went through the form and I couldn't see anywhere to upload a supplementary document. Um, am I right about that, Alan? You can't upload a supplement. You've got four things you can upload. There's nowhere to upload an extra piece of information. Yeah. Um, if, it's, if, there's, if it's not able to do that way and it's something that's really really pertinent uh, can they add know. notes to the cash flow um because what you don't want is every venue now yeah. uploading a supplementary document because i'd have yeah. quite a lot to say about what they could put in that <laughs> yeah and we don't and we don't want a lot of people uh sending us emails saying here's all the stuff that we couldn't fit yeah onto that um I think that's absolutely the challenge of what we're now getting. I mean, you know, there are word limits for a reason. They're really onerous. We all feel your pain because mm. you and I have spent 
weeks and months of our lives reducing down words to fit word counts and we absolutely yeah. know how awful it is but at the same time you have to be sympathetic to Alan and his team that they're going to have an awful lot of applications to go through and yeah. that's why they do limit what you can put in yeah and by the way ampersand don't yeah. count in the word count so don't use the word and use an ampersand because you'll get however many extra words <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know it was we, we wanted to try and make this as as simple i know it's a complicated issue but we wanted to try and make it as simple and as you know as less daunting mm. as possible so we didn't want you to say you've got to fill in a thousand words for this and use 20 questions um but it couldn't be completely light touch either yeah so it's you know th th this is the thing and actually one of the things i really really need to stress that i feel is it is I hope doesn't become a problem with this, which is that the the the, the application online has to be filled in in one set in one sitting. Yep. I need to stress that that because um, I hate to think that some people are going to do it, go away, and find that they've lost what they've put in. So really, making sure that the words are prepared somewhere else, and you're either yep. cutting and pasting into it and getting it done in one session, or that you know that you're going to be able to complete when you start. I mean, we're in the the reality of what it is is you know Creative Scotland. As you can see, this isn't my Creative Scotland office. I am working from home. Everybody has been working from home for the mm. last six months. And we have had to create these online portals with everybody in that tech department in their own homes as mm. well. And so, um, well, it's preferable than having paper forms uh, at the moment. It is still something that is evolving in the circumstances that we're all facing and in how we work at the moment. Um, but that is one, I think there will be a lot of things made easier because it's online. Um, but that element of make sure that you can do it from beginning to end in mm. one session is something that I'm sorry, but we've got to stress at the moment. Yeah. Can I, I think this question about extra um, things to, I can't even keep it, I'm losing, sorry, losing my words, um, extra things that they want to add because the 300 word limit is very difficult. Um, there isn't facility in the process at the moment to merge extra documents or to add extra documents. Um, is that anything that there's any scope to change or is that just something that they have to accept that they have to try and squeeze all the information into the format of the form as it exists, Alan? It would be better if we didn't have additional documents. I think just because we are, I mean, again, it's not that we're, as we've said all the way through this, it's not that we're trying to find ways not to fund people, no. um, but as light as we can make this. Um, I mean, do you want me to uh, go to the people building this and see if this is a possibility? I think it would be really helpful if you could check. I mean, one person here said they've had like letters of recommendation from national promoters, agents and artists. I mean, actually, if you got something like that, you'd give them like a minute's glance over. You wouldn't sit and read them in detail, but it would help endorse the venue as a valued music industry entity. Um, and obviously in, in Craig's case about the flood, he doesn't want to write to you about the flood in his application because it's not really pertinent to why they would be applying for funding, but it would explain a cost that's something different. So if it's something that you could clarify for us and we'll let all NBA members know, that would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Yeah. So I'm can we build really something that allows for more supplementary material to be able right, to explain you know, some of these? And perhaps limit that to a number of pages because... I know what I'm like. If I can upload an extra document, <laughs> I'm going to hear everything I've ever done. Um, I'm really aware that we've only got five minutes left, and then I've got to go to a Welsh government meeting, believe it or not. So I'm hopping around the UK today. Um, I think, yeah, I think Lucy, you've done a really good job of getting through most of the questions. Alan, I just wondered if you could say something very brief about the Open Fund, and I think it's something we'll probably try and engage you with on again because. Because most of grassroots music venues don't really have knowledge of Creative Scotland, if you could just tell us a little bit about what that is and then what we'll do is maybe try and book one of these again that we can put on YouTube that everybody, whether they're NBA members or not, could see. That would be really helpful for the sector. 
Yeah. So if to, to boil down what Open Fund can and can't do, it, it's very clear to, it, important to know that Open Fund isn't the national lottery money, so it comes with strings attached, as we were saying earlier about public good. Um, it's made it very difficult sometimes for any type of commercial organisation or uh, companies that are um, limited by shares mm. to come in because the, the lottery guidelines specifically say you cannot use this funding to further fundraise or make profit. However, people can come in and I think where we need to see some ideas coming would be maybe with, uh, with, with programming uh, in terms of if you were putting on a self-contained um, series of gigs that, that, that was uh, picking particularly people who weren't normally getting access in your area to be able to play live, that's something we could look at. The, the, it has to be a self-contained project. It has to, you know, the income and expenditure have to match up. Um, and so... Uh, Yes, if you were having some sort of mentoring role in that, you could you could pay yourself the the way that the venue is used. That might be relevant as a as a hire. Um, so there so there are things that we can look at if we look at it in terms of creative programming. <clears throat> in terms of things like uh, capital, we're very limited in what we can do with capital. But I have for eighteen months been talking to the Scottish government about trying to create some sort of capital fund. Um, that, that would be relevant. We were getting we were getting somewhere by about February, and then COVID came along and spoiled it. Um, so, typically with capital and the open fund, you cannot do equipment only applications to the open fund. But equipment and small capital expenditure can be up to fifty percent. So, if it was something that what we maybe need to look at in another day is are there things that need to be done that is capital spend to make reopening safe but is also linked to some sort of uh, creative activity then the balance of that up to the 50 percent for any perfect sheeting different things that might be needed um digital equipment could also be there if we know that there's great there's creative activity so there is something that we will be able to start looking at and now that at least with this fund we've found a way to connect in ways that we haven't before. Hopefully, Kate Scotland doesn't seem so off-putting as it maybe has. Hopefully, we've now found ways that we can think of where we can work with people in the commercial sector who are doing creative work. Then, hopefully, this this an, an opportunity will come from this. Yeah, I mean that, that's exactly what everyone needs to hear, Alan. It's it's about the fact that having not felt that Creative Scotland was connecting with the sector we've now changed that and creative scotland is now moving more into trying to help grassroots music venues across scotland so this is the fund that's open at the moment and then we need to explore the further possibilities beyond that and keep the dialogue very much open and um you know i think we need to say thank you that, that you're making so much effort with your team to do that because we know that it's something that you've had a will to do but the opportunity hasn't presented itself so yeah. this this kind of this is the start of a new era isn't it yeah it's about trying to find funds that don't come with so many strings attached that it stops sectors coming in i mean we we have a purpose and our our purpose is not going to change which is our purpose is about um you know allowing people to create new art and finding ways for that art to get to audiences so if i was being completely crass about it it's like if that's our purpose then the venues can be a tool towards us delivering that purpose and uh, um then we have to find out how 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 the the venues then become part of that journey for us to be able to say government or lottery have given us money that we have to deliver this type of thing with it well here's a whole sector that can help us do that if we find the ways worth working within the guidelines to be able to do that and it's not about bending the guidelines it's just about uh on on um, either side just being able to find precise activity that will fit with it so yeah 
Okay, I need to I need to go to Wales now. So I'm leaving Scotland and I need to go to Wales. But I need to say thank you so much, Alan and Lucy. Thank you, everybody that has participated in this. If you are an MBA member and you have a question that you don't think has been answered yet, please funnel it by Nick Stewart your coordinator. If there are questions that Lucy and Alan have talked about getting further guidance on, we will give that information back to you via Nick or via our Facebook groups. If anybody's watching this that is not an MVA member and you'd like to join, please fill in the form and we will try and fast track any Scottish applications so that you can share the other resources we're doing. Thank you so much, guys. I'm sure we will be talking a lot again in the next few days. <laughs> And, and can I just say as well, there's our, um, if you go to our website, you'll get the contacts, uh, the phone number and the email address for our inquiries team. So if there was any specific questions, fire it to them. If they can't answer it, they push it on to myself or to the finance team to be able to answer some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.